so welcome to Architectural Acoustics and today we're going to discuss recording studios. Okay, so uh, believe it or not, it's almost the exact opposite from what we've had with control rooms. Okay, so in controls room we have a distinct necessity for accuracy, for uh, essentially translation between different studios, uh, and such uh, just because it's a kind of an engineering job it's a kind of a surgical intervention okay now uh, there is a whole lot to say about recording spaces and a lot of success has been historically achieved with experimental spaces as well so typically it is something that you really want to try right if you have a space it might work for a certain instrument and it might not. It might work in a given context, it might not work in another context. Okay, so we are very proud of our heritage here, I guess some of you share this, of uh, you know being the cradle of trip hop in the 90s. Uh, uh, bands like Portishead, Tricky, these guys kind of set the stage for uh, lo-fi uh, stems and mixes and mastering in that they've totally departed from what was your traditional approach which is detail, breadth, accuracy, kind of uh, transparency of the mix and they really set the stage for the uh, aesthetic of lo-fi. I mean not to say that there weren't underground hip-hop artists in the 80s already who have done a lot of lo-fi stuff uh, but probably more out of necessity than out of an aesthetic conviction. And typically what you have in the, in the culture altogether, both in science and art, is that people who get famous with things are not the people who invent things. Inventors are typically more secluded, hermetic, not interested in the crowd, sociophobic uh, people. And then people who, who actually get popular with stuff, with being the innovators, typically kind of see it and borrow it or reinterpret it or indeed just uh, serve it such that wider audiences may appreciate it. Okay, so for example, as, as far as lo-fi aesthetic goes, uh, maybe you're aware of a hip-hop artist called Sensational who has essentially recorded all his vocals with a headphone stick stuck into a microphone input right the kind of the worst possible microphone thing that you can imagine and you know uh, a stupid four track tape machine with battered tapes and all the rest so so kind of really pushing the the boundary there and evidently he's far less popular than than some people who got more famous with the lo-fi aesthetic Okay, so in, in a similar way, in the rock era, kind of late 70s, early 80s, some of the pioneers uh, started using really weird recording spaces to get huge sounds or kind of different sounds. I mean, it all essentially starts with Abbey Road and Beatles when they really started to use the studio as a creative tool rather than as an accurate reproduction of recorded, of, of uh, played music. Okay, so, so that's the kind of thing that you really want to embrace, I think, especially these days, because with all the marketing that we are fed and, you know, a kind of a dopamine release that we have with new gear, we, we tend to strive and kind of forget this, this crucial moment in history. We tend to strive for you know better gear more plugins faster computers ah this is not good enough uh, and and kind of procrastinate working with the available tools uh, kind of postponing it until i get this until i have a better microphone until i have that but actually the crucial thing is that artistry really flourishes once the limitations are very strong and kind of crippling even Okay, with crippling limitations, you get real artistry coming through. 
okay, in the sense that art is not just craft. Okay, I tend to do to make a distinction here. I mean, if I'm, you know, uh, supposed to do uh, something uh, which feeds on an established tradition, I'm kind of looking at uh, benchmark practice, trying to surpass that. I typically call that craft. Uh, what I use the word art for is when you essentially cross the boundaries or disregard the boundaries even when you set new rules. Okay, so that's real art in my view, when you're setting new rules, when, when the piece of art has an internal structure which is kind of novel and unique to the artwork, rather than following the rules of the trade and the industry and all the rest of it. Okay, so evidently it is really cool and I love, you know, our SSL now and, you know, microphones worth few K, no doubt about that. But what I'm saying is that, you know, don't, don't be mesmerized by this striving for, you know, for, for following the established rules. If you want to be an artist, evidently artists, as I said, you know, they typically don't get famous <laughs> because, because it takes craft to even to squeeze the new forms into kind of digestible form into a form that can be uh, spread to wider audiences. Okay, so in that sense, today's lecture, I'm going to talk mostly about kind of industry standard things in terms of recording studios, but actually I'll keep highlighting the fact that, you know, the experiment is crucial. Okay, and you've seen now with the measurements as well that, you know, the, the response of the room varies hugely just based on the position in the room. Okay, and then you can think of uh, modulating the room and uh, kind of treating it temporarily, treating instruments temporarily, a lot of things that you can do uh, to, to actually uh, get going. And we'll actually, today we're going to do something in a practical, in the practical, which will be quite uh, similar like that. Uh, okay, so recording studios. I mean, Philip Newell's book, by the way, I, I really, you know, can't recommend anything more than that. Uh, I think I've done it already. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of the best, you know, partners at night in bed, uh, unless you have a, a better option, a kind of a living artifact instead. Okay, so uh, first let's talk about diffusers, diffusion and scattering. Uh, as you are used to by now, uh, I'm not going to read through the slides. I'm going to try to make an interesting and cohesive um, story. Uh, to me, the most interesting thing here to know as an engineer who commands this terminology very well is what is the difference between diffusion and scattering? Okay, so th we have both diffusion coefficient and we have a scattering coefficient. So these are actual technical terms. Okay, and uh, essentially the, the difference there is that diffusion coefficient has to do with the evenness of non-specular reflections. Okay, so I'm deliberately <laughs> trying to make this uh, convoluted. So what is a specular reflection? Are we clear with that? Anyone? That's your pool table reflection, okay? That's your reflection where the incident angle is the same as the reflected angle. The kind of thing that you expect, okay? So specular reflections happen off perfect surfaces. There are no perfect surfaces, right? So there are no specular reflections in real life, but they're good enough, uh, near enough for us if you have this kind of well plastered wall, you can consider to have a specular reflection. Except, what's the, what's the thing to consider here? When is a reflection of this wall near perfect, near specular? When you have low frequency. Low or high? Low. Why? Just a hinge. It's a good hinge, but it's just the opposite. So you're a good contrarian as well. <laughs> it's just the opposite. Why is it the opposite? 
Why is it the high frequencies that will give us more likely a specular reflection? Uh, actually, the, uh, the sources are directional. Frequencies themselves are not necessarily directional. Okay, so that's another point of, you know, being accurate here. Sources which project low frequencies are uh, omnidirectional, more so. Um, the thing is, so any other hints? It has to do with relative sizes. Okay, so in acoustics, a lot of things, okay, all things, I might say, have to do with the fact that we are, are the range of audible frequencies actually cover, you could say, multiple orders of magnitude. Okay, so the bass frequencies are much uh, farther from high frequencies in the way that... Uh, in the way that they uh, interact with the environment. Okay, so the size relationship here is crucial. Okay, so if I wanted a specular reflection for a base frequency, I would need a much bigger wall. Okay, so remember that, I don't know what's, what's a good one, I think um, uh, 10 hertz is uh, 17 meters, am I saying this right? 34 meters, 340 meters per second. Right, so definitely, you know, we can hear a frequency that does not fit in this room, okay? And we can hear a frequency that fits in the width of my nail as well. Okay, so these are huge differences, and the interaction of uh, airborne sound and objects has everything to do with the relative size of the period of wavelength, I should say, and the object itself. Okay, so that's, that's, that's a crucial thing here. So typically we get specular reflections of kind of everyday walls only for high frequencies. Okay, so specular reflections. Now, uh, diffusion and scattering. Okay, so diffusion coefficient tells us how even are the non-specular reflections. Okay, so all the reflections that go off into a different direction, if I put it uh, simply, uh, will go off in a different direction, and the diffusion coefficient tells me what is the balance of different angles of reflection. Okay, so the highest possible diffusion coefficient is something you get if you have an even distribution of all the reflection angles. It means the incident sound will be reflected in all possible directions evenly. Okay, that's your maximum diffusion coefficient. The scattering coefficient does not say anything about the evenness of reflections. It just says something about the amount of non-specular reflections. Okay, so it just tells you, scattering coefficient tells you that this amount of energy has been reflected oddly, to put it like that, compared to the amount of energy that has been reflected normally. Okay, so that's, that's the thing. I mean, again, who knows if this is going to be of any use any time in your life. But to me, it seems like those are the kind of, you know, the crucial things that, that really make a difference in terms of, you know, understanding stuff. Okay, cool. So as I said already, the surface makes a huge difference. The uh, granularity of the surface, again, has to do with a lot to do with um, uh, the, the spectral characteristic. Okay, so both diffusion coefficient and scattering coefficient will depend on the frequency, right? So actually, if you want good diffusion, what you really want is uneven surfaces, okay? And if you want good diffusion across the spectrum, then what you really want is irregularity at multiple uh, 
dimensions. Okay, so you want irregularities down to a few centimeters or less. You want irregularities at about kind of 10, 20 centimeters. You want irregularities at the scale of one, two meters. And you actually want irregularities at the sizes or around the sizes of 10 to 15 meters if you want to diffuse, to have a diffuse base response. Okay, so actually, if, if you look at the diffusers, the kind of the standard uh, kind of vertical diffusers, you've probably seen a few, we have a few around the studios as well, or the kind of horizontal vertical where you have uh, kind of squares coming in and out of the surface, right? You can already criticize that for being random only at a given scale. Okay, uh, in my experience, I have had... Uh, uh, in, in, in recording environments, I think the most beautiful room I have ever been in and recorded in was kind of homemade DIY thing with, um, it's a kind of a plaster thing, uh, you know, just the kind of thing you mix with water and it kind of stiffens up and it was just randomly thrown on the walls. But indeed you had kind of humps which were quite big and dips which were quite big. I mean, obviously you don't get humps which are 10 meter uh, size, but the kind of one to two meters uh, sizes were actually obviously kind of big humps coming out of the wall, some dips and so on. And then also on a kind of a mid size scale, you had variation, random stuff and the actual porousness, the, 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 the actual material that was used also had a very fine kind of grain detail and all the rest. So, you know, randomness across multiple scales. scales. This, in fact, was uh, a very reflective surface as well. Okay, so if you want lush diffusion, you don't want to absorb the sound. Okay, so th that's, that's f quite interesting. I mean, the point about recording spaces is that once you understand that every recording will have a space, even if it's negligible, once you understand that it's inescapable, so to speak, then you start working towards the kind of space uh, acoustic that you really desire, rather than trying to exclude it from the recording and kind of uh, add it on top later on. Okay, so that's that we still kind of have that paradigm uh, lingering, although already in the kind of prog rock era uh, and even starting with with Beatles in Abbey Road, what you have is the the understanding that uh, uh, I mean, actually, it, 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 it hasn't quite crystallized that early because you you had to have a, f a decade of actual you know, useful, usable, quality, artificial reverberation, which was not available in the 60s. The reverberation algorithms are one of the most uh, CPU intensive things. Uh, so digital reverberation was not very much available. And as far as plate and, and uh, spring reverbs go, they have a very kind of uh, recognizable characteristic. They're nowhere near uh, the uh, reverberation you get from the room. And then also you had pioneers who would actually have reverberation chambers. Okay, so just a speaker and a microphone in a chamber that is reflective, that seems to uh, have a, a musical acoustic, and then use that. So after a decade of having decent digital reverberation, people actually realize that, some people realize, again, it's an aesthetic decision, but that, uh, they prefer to uh, to record in a space that is appropriate for the instrument and the music rather than try to record it spaceless right in a completely dead environment and then add things on top and obviously i'm talking here about acoustical instruments i mean once you start mixing it with digital sources things uh, get to be quite different Okay, so, and it, it's a similar thing, I guess you've heard this from Stephen many times, don't rely on post-processing in recording. 
okay there is always an anomaly with every process you add okay and again this has to do with acoustic sound sources and it has to do with fidelity high fidelity reproduction so if you want to do lo-fi who cares you do lo-fi if you're doing electronic sources you're going to be manipulating this anyway but if you really want to preserve the detail the quality of an acoustic instrument as soon as you put an EQ on top there are things that will uh, suffer okay and that's probably the the biggest challenge in learning the trade is to be able to uh, figure out how you want this to sound differently and in achieving the target sound managing to hear out all the things that are being ruined it's always a trade-off you know there is always something that is slightly ruined evidently we're working in the way that we fix more things than we break hopefully but the thing is that we are blinded by the fixing blinded by the gear uh, or i should say deafened probably right so so you that's 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 the thing i cannot do i admit you know you give me a mix i work on my music sometimes on other people's music and i'm like okay i want it to sound like this and like that and it does and i'm like yes i've got it and uh, it really takes listening back to the original unpro unprocessed recordings for me to realize what I have ruined. And then I can make a decision whether I'm breaking or fixing more things with the process. And typically I would start reducing some of the processing once I compare it to the unprocessed sound. But I, I cannot maintain an awareness or, or a perception of what is being ruined when I'm striving to fix something. Okay, I know that, you know, masters of the trade do this and they know this. And as soon as you do a process, like, but wait a minute, that's being ruined, right? Either the, the width of the mix or something about the transients or something about transparency or the depth or there's always something that you're ruining when you're fixing something else. Okay, so that's why probably the most challenging thing is not you know understanding the scattering and uh, and um, diffusion coefficients uh, at least for me those things kind of stick uh, i didn't look at what they were and last time i talked about this was a year ago but for some reason i always remember what the difference is it's the technical inspiration that i have but you know to be able to 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 follow the to, to kind of have this perception it's just beyond me you know i'll probably have to quit my academic job and you know sit in the studio 10 days uh, uh, a week i wanted to say 10 hours a day okay cool uh so yeah i've kind of uh, uh talked about scattering diffusion so what does it help okay so it helps the lushness it definitely helps the comp filtering effect Okay, so we have done this. This is crucial. We have tried to identify the comp filtering from a reflection in a random room, right? And I've seen, uh, you know, most of you have seen only your room and kind of your group's work. But what I can conclude, and for me, this is a first off as well. We didn't have uh, this amount of measurement in previous years. What I can conclude that indeed, it is not something that you necessarily have to worry about because the measurements show that you know you either find it or you don't find it, it in any case it is not very clear right so uh, the point being that if we take an anechoic chamber which we don't and have a very reflective surface and then do the kind of setup and measurement that we've done then most likely definitely i should say you will have a very clear sense of you know the exact comp notches that we can predict okay but that's the point that you see we are kind of in between engineering and art or craft so if you talk to an engineer it's the first thing that comes to mind and they're like okay well that's horrible so let us just you know uh, uh, put an absorber 
where we expect a strong reflection, so we avoid comp filtering. Okay? And then a total musician says, comp what? Okay? And th then we are hopefully somewhere in between where we also understand the technical aspects of this. And if someone questions us, we can explain this using the appropriate terminology. But actually, from the musician point of view, you know, you also should have more insight and know that, you know, you have to listen to the microphone stem. You have to have an internal reference of what is a good detailed recording and you have to recognize that this is insufficient and you have to have some basic understanding of how you can move the microphone change the microphone move the instrument move the orientation of the instrument add something to the wall get into a different room to get the kind of recording which is really musical because if you're just a musician you are more likely to be like yeah, I'll just record whatever it's important that I do a good performance, evidently, that's the perspective. And then obviously I'll get a good mixing engineer, good mastering, we will fix it. Okay, so that's what that, that's, that's what's the most beautiful thing I would say about this trade that we're in, that we are, you know, both feet stable in two completely distant departments. That's, that's what we're really looking for, okay? So both tech and, um, and art like that. Okay, uh, so comp filtering reduced, resonant modes reduced as well. Okay, I, I'm unsure if you guys watched this uh, lecture from last, um, uh, last week, but one of the things to, to understand, which is also technically crucial, is how and when does the geometry of the room actually remove or attenuate the modes? Okay, so the, the message there is that the modes of the room depend on the geometry of the room and the modes themselves really depend on parallel reflective surfaces. Okay, so I said par parallel reflective surfaces so if you want to fix this, you can remove or at least deal with either one of those. So with the fact that they're parallel or the fact that they're reflective. Both of these will attenuate the modes. Okay, so typically we don't have the opportunity to move walls around. So we just absorb stuff. What is the issue with absorbing stuff? Any ideas? Well, typically the issue is that you cannot quite absorb bass and definitely not the subs, okay? And the high frequencies are very easily absorbed. So typically, as soon as you get into absorption, you are creating a disbalance in the spectral character of your reverberation. Okay, so again, we have this issue with magnitudes of scale that bass frequencies behave completely differently from high frequencies, okay? And bass frequencies, we have very few tools for, while high frequencies are actually more easy to tackle. Okay, so I'm, I'm suggesting, you know, use your ears and be attentive to the context. Uh, there is no one size fits all there is no magic potion. Uh, there is perception, attention, and creativity. Okay, pragmatic creativity. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why these measurements, I think, are really useful. Because if you manage to feel confident about it, in terms of, oh, I can set it up in five minutes, so you're going to do it again today, and hopefully the speed of the setup increases, if you have a sense of it being your basic tool, you're likely to use it more often and you're likely to discover things for yourself. Okay, rather than rely on the recipes and like, okay, this is what you do. You, you know, absorb the first reflections, you diffuse the back wall, that's about it. Good day, could get on with life. Okay, so if you're really interested in acoustics, you know, this is your 
only real uh, screen, so to speak, your only display of what is actually going on. Okay? Cool. So uh, the, the interesting thing, by the way, that I was getting to is that if you have slightly splayed walls, so that are slightly off parallel, they will uh, attenuate higher frequency modes. To actually tackle real low frequency modes, you need quite a lot of angle, so to speak, off parallel walls. Okay, so the angle, again, will, angled walls will reduce room modes, but again, frequency dependent, in a frequency dependent fashion. So for, for, for in order to tackle low frequency, you really have to, you really need a large angle. Okay. Cool. Uh, scattering. Uh, it might reduce reverberation time. So this is actually one of those things that uh, is a superficial statement. Why? It should be your, your first go-to, frequency dependence, okay? Everything is frequency dependent. So if I say it reduces reverberation time, then it says, who cares about the absolute reverberation time, okay? What you really care for is balanced reverberation, the spectral characteristic of reverberation, which is what we're going to tackle in the practical today, because you could have a situation where reverberation time is appropriate, let's say, to the purpose, control room, 0 0.3 seconds reverberation time, great, box ticked. But wait a minute, this is an average across different frequencies, so it might be that you have typically a low frequency reverberation of one and a half seconds and a really dead uh, high frequency characteristic, which is a horrible room, okay? And someone will come in and say, oh, well, my reverberation time is 0 0.3, so it's a perfect control room, but it's the most horrible control room because of this balance across spectrum, okay? So your first question should always be, but the spectral variation, what's up with that, okay? Well, for control rooms, I mean, typically you would want to be, uh, I, I mean, I prefer a dead control room. In fact, I have to say something about, you know, creative control rooms, which I will. But for control room kind of textbook, you want to go below 0 0.6, 0 0.7, I would think. Some people would accept 0 0.7, maybe even 0 0.8, but you really want lower than that. For recording rooms, it's, it's really varied, right? Um, a, a proper dead control room is actually 0 0.3, 0 0.2 seconds reverberation time. Okay. Now, the thing that is, is worth adding here is that in the age of electronic music production, uh, there is an increasing sense of a creative control room. Okay, so typically that's, that's my recipe. My main studio, my home studio, or uh, summer house studio as well, they will have uh, a very beautiful kind of, uh, how should I put it, exaggerated uh, acoustic in terms of both the speakers and the room. Okay, so what you have is kind of inspired by hi-fi. Right? So you have probably heard some stuff on the ATCs by now and you said, I cannot believe how horrible this sounds. Did you have this experience with ATCs? I think I've heard, uh, like, I think I played like Michael Jackson from the 80s, like, you know, kind of proper, you know, production. And I was like, oh my God, this is horrible. Like totally narrow, totally dead, pim, 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 no breath, no depth, nothing. I was like, wow, I cannot believe this. Uh, the, the point being is that in a, the hi-fi people are totally different from engineers. Okay? And there is one 
uh, kind of, uh, uh, how should I put it, um, thread or, 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 uh, or, uh, or a seed of interaction, which kind of started, I would say, with Proac speakers. Okay, so Proac is a British manufacturer of speakers and good hi-fi, great hi-fi. I don't know if you know much about hi-fi freaks, but sometimes they spend a thousand quid on a cable, you know, just, you know. Uh, so typically no issues with spending cash and, you know, huge rooms, whatever speakers worth uh, you can imagine. Uh, so what happens is that there is a distinction. So hi-fi people want beautiful sound, right? Engineers want accurate sound reproduction. So this is the kind of thing that you can't really make a good balance of. And ATC is the engineer's tool, okay? It is an accurate speaker. Proac is a hi-fi speaker. And then about 10, 15 years ago, a craze started when mastering engineers started using the Proac Studio 100 and in a few years, the price of this speaker tripled. And about six, seven years ago, they've withdrawn the original one. Uh, and then they've introduced a revised version and tripled the price again. Okay, as you know, this is how business works. You can set the price based on the demand. Who cares about the, you know, <laughs> how much it actually costs to build. Okay, so this is a hi-fi manufacturer that has penetrated the engineers' minds and ears because it was so beautiful, okay? And that's, and that's the thing that I'm trying to get to. So in terms of control rooms, if y it is your creative workspace, you really don't want it to be that accurate. That accurate is, a, is you know, a, a, a surgeon, surgery hall, or I don't know how you call this, you know, totally... Um, disinfected, sterile, you know, no life to it. That's the point of it. You exclude all possible life because it could be harmful if, uh, if a patient is exposed, right? So match that with the, uh, with, I mean, do you want to work in a lifeless environment? You do want to if you are fixing life if you're performing surgery you definitely want a lifeless environment but if it is your creative work lifeless environment might as well kill your motivation as well okay so my recipe here is to have a creative control room so it is still tuned to you know be transparent be all the things you may want it to be in terms of uh uh, parameters like that but it has to be full of life full of inspiration so and once uh, I've done something in my creative control room and found the magic okay pro X speakers were the first ones although I had kind of early experience with some hi-fi freaks that allowed me to sit in the sweet spot but uh, pro X speakers were the first when I just you know said okay this is it it was really crucial for me because I suddenly got the benchmark. I know that it can be totally magical. I know that it can surpass all possible expectations, which is now my expectation, which is really crucial because if you, if you sit, you know, that's the kind of internal reference. If you don't have, you know, uh, a, a reference point, which is utmost magic, amazing, um, you know, I, I, do I have a, do you have words that go beyond this? I don't know. I'm stuck with magic for today, but beautiful, whatever, all, all the possible things you can imagine. If you don't have that internal reference, you kind of don't know what you're striving for. So for me, the thing is that I know that my setup, my creative control room does this. A, a lot of music that I play there is beyond anything imaginable. So I know that my creative output has to wear that appearance. It has to become like that. And it's, th the funny thing is I achieve that in my beautiful control room and then I take it to the surgery. I take it to, you know, 
a large control room with ATCs, and I realize it doesn't actually sound like that. But by then, I know how it's supposed to sound. And then it's a matter of surgery and a bit of engineering knowledge to make it sound like I know it can sound. And once that is done, then the uh, translation actually works. So how do you achieve the conditions of that perfect image in the first place? It, it has to do with your own ears, with the kind of music, with the kind of space, with the kind of speakers, speaker uh, positioning, everything plays a role. Okay? And because everything plays a role, I hope you understand by now that the science, the causality altogether works only when you reduce variables. As soon as you have multiple variables, you cannot establish a causal relationship. This is not quite clear to many of us. Uh, so you have to play with it. You have to change this, change that, get a different pair, get this, get that. So first of all, my recommendation is try to get a chance to hear such beautiful spaces. You know, maybe some hi-fi showrooms will do the trick when they actually have this tuned very well. And, you know, you play, uh, you measure it, you play a sign sweep and like, no, this is not a good room. You play music in there and you're mesmerized. You're totally flattened. Right. So th it's just trial and error. I mean, I can tell you a few uh, hints. I've done this a few times myself in different rooms. So. Uh, if you invite me to your space, I'll be like, hmm, I would probably do this or that, which is my hunch at, you know, how to get there, but nothing without trial and error. There's too many variables for causal relationship. Okay? So different speakers. I mean, the, the thing is that, you know, in UK, we are really lucky. In fact, if anyone wants to join me on Monday, I'm probably going to go, a guy's going to set up a pair of uh, PMC DB1s in an office. Uh, PMC speakers is actually one of the best things I've heard because probably I've heard them in a really amazing uh, acoustic uh, control room as well. And they were the ones that are kind of 30K as well, I think 25 or some. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the nice thing about being here is that if you have already some cash in the gear, around you, you can keep exchanging it. You know, if you are an eBay addict like me, you can even earn money by, you know, selling for a good price and always buying cheap and kind of keep a circulation of things. You know, keep the things that you are only totally convinced about and, you know, keep selling and reselling other things. I mean, on top of that, there should be still about 70 of you left, 60 something in the third year. You know, how many pairs of monitors? I mean, maybe most of these are kind of 500 quid uh, entry level uh, monitors, but it's likely that someone has this or that. Uh, I don't know. My student in Belgrade, his, his uh, auntie from Canada sent him a pair of barefoots. <laughs> you know, it's like, shit, please. I'm like, let's go, let's go, let's hear them. You know, you have to have this motivation to hear different speakers, hear different rooms, and learn these things. And the speaker positioning is so crucial as well. So if you're into this, I hope this is the thing you choose. By the way, if you do speaker positioning for your uh, measurement, uh, you know, it's kind of necessary to be done by two people. So find a, a, a fellow student who is also wanting to do speaker positioning and do both together, okay? Because someone has to move the speaker. It just doesn't work. You cannot go back and forth. The reference is lost very quickly. You have to be set in the same spot and someone moving the speaker for the, for the um, kind of aesthetic assessment, obviously. Okay? So a lot of trial and error. I think that's the only recipe here. And your internal references, you know, dealing with this day in and day out. Okay, uh, smoother decay. So, I mean, the, the characteristic of reverb decay is very advanced concept to uh, get hold of, grab hold of. 
what we will do in the practical will be the spectral characteristic of reverberation, which kind of makes sense because there is a different di reverb time for different frequencies. Okay, that's fairly straightforward. Now, with the smoothness of reverberation decay, I've already talked about the hump and the dip type decay, right? And we've said a few things about this. But even within that, you could have bumps and weird things happening. Uh, now, you've already hopefully learned a lot by just clicking on the smoothing characteristic or, or setting of your measurement graph and hopefully a bit surprised as well. And now when you see a speaker characteristic, which looks flat and doesn't have a million of details in there, you know it's just smoothed out to hell and back, right? So th there is no such thing as a flat acoustic uh, characteristic spectrally. There is a smoothed characteristic, right? there has to be millions of ups and downs in each spectral measurement, as you have seen by now. Uh, now, in terms of the smoothness of decay, it is, it is a tough one. Okay, so can you, what would be the good smoothing factor to observe it? If you smooth it, of course, it's going to be smooth. If you don't smooth it, of course, it's going to be ragged. Okay. So it's actually kind of the next level thing if you want to get into assessing reverberation and acoustic. Okay, so I've talked about scattering diffusion coefficient. Here are some things. This is, you know, the slideshow is there for you to go through to revise things and ideas and hopefully realize what is it that I am uh, fascinated about and what is it that I don't even uh, mention. Uh, in any case, a whole lot of resources there. We have in the reading list a uh, book written by Cox, uh, which is Diffusion and Scattering. So you can read all about it, a whole lot of detail. There's a lot of math in there as well. You can calculate the response of these diffusers and scattering um, uh, solutions. Um, I think I've proposed, it's worth uh, repeating that diffusion is all about randomness and it's not about the amount of cash you spend you know so kind of recycled material diffusion is just so kind of uh, it, it, it makes so much sense okay a lot of people you will find swear by bookshelves you know if you have books already put the bookshelves in the right position you have the kind of random surface going on already so there's a lot of things you can do in order to produce random surfaces. Okay. Uh, cool. Now, slowly but surely, we're getting to recording rooms. Okay. So the funny thing is there's quite a lot of anecdotes, a lot of interesting things from professionals. You know, again, it's the kind of trade that you learn by doing. Uh, now... One of the interesting terms here is driving a room and collecting a room. Okay, so again, bear in mind that the acoustic field in the room is like an ocean surface in three dimensions. This is my best metaphor so far. So if you measure if you try to, uh, uh, let's say, reproduce the beauty of a waving ocean by looking at one point in space, or I should say in plane, and how it is moving up and down, you understand you haven't got a clue about the beauty of the surface of the ocean, right? You just know one point and it moves up in this pattern. There is nothing to it, okay? So please remember this metaphor every time you think about, okay, this microphone is amazing. It's gonna do a great job. 
whatever it does, the only thing it does, it just tells you about one point, how it moves up and down on an ocean surface. And it's more complex than that because it's a 3D ocean surface like that. Okay. And in 3D, it's, you know, it's just this one point somewhere in space and you know how it's moving up and down. It does not necessarily uh, reproduce the beauty of an acoustic field. Okay? And because we have two ears and they're real, there is real complex neurology that uh, derives sensation from the relationship of the sound you get in the two ears with the two ears we actually have a good sense of space of the beauty of the acoustical space uh, it is a kind of a funny anecdote uh, i'm still unsure of it uh, but in any case one of my good friends in fact i kind of consider him my guru although he doesn't want me to uh, guy who has received, you know, he has received European Jazz Award and, you know, he's just an amazing musician, great ear, you know, he kind of, uh, you know, tells Jack the Jeanette what to do and shit like that, you know, kind of really up high in the game. And I had a chance, he kind of picked me up a decade ago and had the chance to work with him. And he told me, we played on stages together and he said, I know how it sounds in the audience. And I'm a kind of a skeptical, you know, rely on the, on the rational, you know, conclusivity of thought. And I'm like, yeah, right, you know. And, you know, I keep thinking about this. It's, it's, it's kind of, you know, I, he's an honest guy. He's not the kind of guy who would just, you know, say it because it makes him sound, you know, superior to everyone else, although who knows. But in any case, It's, it's a really funny claim. It's, it's something that I'm still kind of unsure about. And I'm like, well, how? And he says, well, it's probably the 5,000th, you know, occasion for me to be on a stage with monitoring, with the PA. And I just know how it sounds in the audience. I'm like, yeah, man, but, you know, technically, practically, you m cannot know how it sounds in the audience. You're on a stage. You're on behind monitors. And he's like, trust me, I know. And I do trust him. I trust everyone, at least their good intentions, not necessarily what they say. But uh, it's, it's a really funny thing because I, I think that there could be, you know, it, it could actually be the case that after 5,000 times on stage, you know, you know how it sounds in the audience, even if your ears are not there. You know, that, that has to do with this metaphor of a 3D ocean surface. And, and the fact that our perception is not just the, you know, just the excursion of the eardrums. You know, if you look at the neurology of perception, the amount of layers, you know, the, the amount of complexity that goes into producing a perception from sensation, it is huge. So I kind of have the idea that, yeah, I, I sort of buy it, more or less, still with the, you know, with a bit of salt. Uh, but a bit of salt, what am I supposed to say? With <laughs> Grain of salt, yeah. <laughs> you know, but that's the thing, you know, somehow, you know, I, I kind of know how it sounds back in the room. I mean, I've been in the back of this room listening to other lectures and I know it's horrible. In fact, it's a good time to announce that next week we're going to swap the tutorial, uh, the practical and the lecture. So we're going to do a, a practical here because we want to measure this room together. OK, we're going to get into kind of speech intelligibility, clarity and all the rest of that. And this is the kind of room that we need to do this and we don't have it later. So we're going to do a practical in the morning. Um, and I've sat in the back in the room and I know it sounds horrible and it, the aircon is louder than you want it and it's just not a great thing. Um, this microphone, when it's on, it actually does help quite a lot. I've realized as well. Uh, so yeah, th that's, that's this kind of, you know, who knows, 
hands in the air. Who believes that you can know how something sounds? I don't think he meant in that way. Okay, interesting. What do you think? Because I don't think he thought about the exact way he would perceive the sound if he was in the back of the room. I think he meant the way the audience will hear it in the way that he's aware that the audience won't hear every detail of a uh, double bass that he will so he knows what sort of elements of each instrument are get, getting out to the audience and he will perceive well but th that is part of how you hear it i mean i mean i i don't see, see a real distinction between how someone would hear it and how i would hear it because you know i'm not i don't have anyone else's brain or ears to start with uh so so the question is I do agree that we could uh, talk about the kind of things you may be able to to uh, uh, predict in terms of in terms of the sound, and that that's probably a, a really good way of thinking. It's 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 it, it reminds me of this uh, distinction between you know uh, uh, the sense of free will and the sense of free agency. You know, because if you think of free will, it's a kind of a poetic term and it's like, yeah, well, I want a pair of barefoots as well as a pair of ATCs and a pair of PMCs, so I have free will. But actually this will is very much determined by, by my environment because, you know, it has to, first of all, be available. I have to develop a, a desire for this, which is, everything all, all of this has to do with the social environment right so free agency on the other hand is more similar to what you're mentioning here is that you are not claiming that you know how it sounds which is again this abstract all-encompassing and not very specific claim but instead you know what are the things that you could you know predict okay how does the bass come through how does this come through what is lost in the translation and, and things like that. So actually I would agree, but that, that is still something that technically, if I have not, if I, if I have not been seated in the audience of that very room, I have little rational ground for claiming it. But then again, practically, if I've sat in, you know, in the audience of, 500 holes, if I have played in 5,000 holes, I kind of recognize the character of the hole. I already know what type it is. So progressively, I can develop a sense and knowledge indeed about what is lost in the translation. How does something sound in a different corner of the room? Okay. And this, the reason why we're talking about this is to, to kind of uh, understand the importance of striving for knowing how to drive a room and this is something that i've learned or at least i had a hint about uh, from uh, some uh, free improvisers I've, I've joined them in uh, like a small chapel uh, actually uh, in slovenia and uh, and we went in and i'm like mm -hmm, lovely sound you know kind of reverberant but not too large kind of cozy and kind of magical you know religion is a lot about uh, a sense of magic as well um so uh and then they went in and they're like oh but it it's it's this it has this tone and they start whistling around i mean some improvising musicians like me when i improvise i do it because you know, I can't play tunes and I love to make sound instead. But some improvised musician can play all the tunes immediately, repeat whatever they hear, any melody, any chord that they hear, they know immediately what it is. They kind of beyond music more than before music, like me, in a certain sense. So they're like, ah, oh, here. And they start whistling into the room and discovering the 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 the, the mold of the room, the, the chord of the room. Like, wow, you know, so they actually hear the room. They know how to drive it. And walking around the space also changes this. OK, so I don't know. I hope you will have a chance to see this happen. It's really amazing when someone can do this. Just walk around the room, whistle around. It's like, hmm, and actually hear what type of uh, 
harmonies are supported in which areas of the room. It just happens. They just do it. It's mesmerizing. Okay? And that's, that's what happens with real good musicians. If you give them a really interesting, complex, large room uh, to record in, you know, they will probably ask you to pick a spot for themselves rather than you being like, okay, you sit there, you sit there, I put a separation here because I've seen photos of this and that's how recording is done, okay? You've seen the variation of spectral response based on minute positions, on large positions. You can expect that this is the case. We have solid evidence that this is the case, okay? And if you're an instrumentalist, you know, learn to drive a room yourself. You know, get into a different corners of the room, different positions, and listen out for the detail. Okay? So that's one term, driving the room. And the other interesting term is collecting the room. Okay? So this is your engineering, your recording engineer's uh, skill that you also know that in it's inevitable that you will collect some of the room response. Okay, so you might as well collect it in a really good way, which is appropriate to the instrument, appropriate for the, you know, for the tonic of the tunes played, appropriate for the context and all the rest for the microphone. And again, you know, how do you learn this? You just learn it by practice. Okay, get into a room, set up 10 microphones, uh, produce an accurate representation of where each microphone is and then spend hours comparing the sound of these microphones in different positions. Okay, learn how a room can be collected. Okay, I mean evidently, you know, this is the kind of art form that requires huge amount of time and investment and all the rest. You know, typically you know, if you don't have the time, you just put the microphone up. Is it good enough? It's good enough. And there we go. Okay. But there is something to be said about this, um, th this, uh, you know, art of collecting the room and, you know, just producing a recording, which is stunning without processing, without anything, just bam. Okay. Cool. Um, so yeah, recording rooms. I mean, I'll go briefly through the classes, which is textbook stuff. Uh, this is mostly from uh, Philip Newell's book. So I do recommend you go through his writing. That's the first hand um, information source here. So here we go, neutral rooms. So what you want, what you're looking at in neutral rooms is uh, kind of... Uh, all-purpose rooms okay so it's not specifically good for anything in specific it is good for most things okay so some enrichment of character neutrality I mean with recording rooms just like you may expect size matters okay the bigger the better that's kind of the thing that you really want to uh, have a look at or, or have access to Okay, uh, neutral rooms, read all about it. Uh, there is some structural sketches here in terms of producing a neutral room. Uh, obviously, you know, a flat spectral response is the kind of neutrality that we're looking at. You need a huge room, you need to have some uh, adjustment if there are parallel walls. <coughs> typically quite a lot of absorption, okay, because you cannot achieve neutrality uh, very easily if you don't absorb quite a bit. Okay, here are some hints at how you treat different uh, spectral ranges. Okay, uh, isolation shells. I'm, I'm still surprised how many people... Uh, would spend that amount of cash for for I mean it's you know it's kind of room in the room thing um, to me it seems necessary only if you are 
you know, suffering from external noises. But any case, um, depends what you, uh, depends on your resources. Okay, so here is one really interesting thing. So this is the 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 technical uh, approach to uh, the differences across spectrum in terms of room response. Okay, so what we have there is essentially four regions. And the most controversial region here, read all about it, uh, is the pressure zone. Okay, so the point is that you understand by now that if you have uh, a certain size room, based on the size, the lowest modes will give you issues. Okay? Uh, if you have a smaller room, the lowest modes are well into mid-base, well, at least base. If you have a sufficiently large room, the lowest modes, the first order modes are sub-base and you have less issues. Okay, that's kind of the reason why we prefer large rooms as well, because the zone which suffers from the lowest modes is the biggest issue. Okay, so if you manage to have those kind of sub base area, then you're well off. If you don't, you typically have a problem. That's why we have problems with small rooms. Now, the interesting debate and debate by all means, because professionals disagree, is what's up with the pressure zone. So technically, pressure zone does not have these undulations in spectral response. Okay, so the room is too small for this base to behave weirdly, okay? It behaves like a pressure zone. There is no, there is not enough space in the room to have high pressure and low pressure at the same time in different positions. The whole room goes up and down in pressure as the base is being transmitted or produced within the room. Okay, so that's your pressure zone. It is really interesting. I've actually discovered this before I knew the technical terms. Uh, some decades ago, I had a really narrow and wide room. Uh, and the only practical thing, because one end was the door, the other end was the window, the only practical thing was to have my speakers you know, on the shorter side of the room, which was actually, I think, about two meters, maybe even less. So, I, th in fact, what I had is a single bed and a desk, and I could sit at the desk from my bed. And I had speakers there against the wall. Not, not a great prediction of acoustic there. I was stunned and mesmerized how good the bass sounded. There was something really clean about the bass. And I was like, OK, fine. I didn't even care. It was actually even before I did um, studies in acoustics. And I was like, fine, great. It was a funny occurrence. Who cares? I moved out. And then years, even decades later, I, I studied this and realized that, wow, that actually makes sense. So if the dimension is sufficiently small, compared to the wavelength of the base, there is no high pressure, low pressure at the same time. The whole system functions as one, so to speak. Okay, so technically there will be a roll off. Okay, so the response will not be uh, at the level. So in terms of the relationship between the pressure zone and the mode controlled zone, there is an issue, okay? But as far as the response, <laughs> fuck, see? as far as the response, it's true, yeah. If I'm s superstitious, I'm like, okay, that's Almighty telling us. As far as the um, <laughs> great, we're done anyway. So as far as the response within the pressure zone goes, it's quite flat. Okay, so there is something about extremely small rooms, and what you will see 
is that sometimes they just record a double bass in the smallest booth available in a big, big studio. Okay, so I'm really highlighting this because it's kind of counterintuitive if you have this basic understanding, okay, size, frequency, bass needs a lot of space and all the rest. Pressure zone is one of those really interesting things to consider. And as I said, experts disagree. You know, you will find people who say, nah, bullshit, you just avoid it. Don't, don't, don't deal with it. And there's other people who say, wait a minute. Uh, so my advice is, you know, don't trust me or them or anyone do your work you know do your experiments do your trials and errors okay that's that's the only thing that i can really recommend stay stay skeptical stay critical you know you, you're the only authority in fact that's the funny thing because if you say i trust someone you're actually still the higher authority it's a funny thing it's it's kind of goes uh, it's, it's, it's a different way of approaching religious attitude because, you know, on the surface of things, if you say someone is religious, oh, well, they kind of, you know, subordinate themselves, subordinate themselves to a god or something superior. But actually, it is still them who gives authority to the almighty. So by doing this, you're actually pushing yourself above the Almighty, because it is only you who can say that that is to be trusted. So in any case, you have bigger trust. That There is no way of escaping the fact that what you trust is something that you are actually subordinating because you're choosing to trust it. So your decision has to be on top of what you trust, right? It's a really funny, funny thing to realize. I, I don't know if I've made sense of it anyway. But in any case, the message is, you know, do your thing. Okay, a few more kind of textbook things, standard things, dialogue rooms, size like this, rooms with character. So moving on from neutral rooms, essentially what we have is a distinction between bright rooms, okay, so typically short reverberation times there, uh, large reflections which die away quickly. Okay, so this has to do with the hump in the decay of the room. Okay, so and as you know by now, hopefully, and this will be hammered on a bit more, is that very early reflections really support the sound source. Okay, you don't want to get rid of them in the context of recording okay in the context of monitoring if you strive for accuracy you don't really want that because then that is improving the sound of how the instruments sound right so you don't want in monitoring situation to improve in your surgical monitoring situation okay and and that's and that's this magic of of you know a mix sounding, I would think, horrible in a surgical control room because it relies on the fact that you will play it back in a regular room. Okay? So, and it, it's, it's one of those things. So I've said about this Michael Jackson productions, which, you know, sound poppy and flat and nothing about it. And then you play it on shit speaker in a shit room and it sounds really good. Okay? So the same thing holds uh, when I produce stuff for clubs, uh, you know, I really want to hear it in a really large, horrible room on terribly loud shit speakers, you know, because then I have the baseline. I, I have something to relate to. And typically, if you produce club music at home and you play it in a club, it is too dense. It is too much. There is too much going on, right? So the art there is to have a minimal set of sound sources that are crucially musical together in combination that actually give you a sense of space and emptiness. Okay, so my, my kind of uh, uh, benchmark for a magical club music production is I entered the room, oh wow, it's a big room, and I play the music and the room grows larger. 
Okay, so you, you actually have productions and you play huge levels, obviously, and suddenly the space grows. Okay, if you play your music loud in a club and a big space becomes crammed and you're like, okay, well, this is great because it's full of energy or like full of presence or full of activity, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that that will work in the context. You know, try to try to get the increase of size is my suggestion. OK, uh, and then reverberant wet rooms, obviously more uh, more reverberant, quite a lot of things there. Read all about it. Stone rooms. I still wish to build my own. I don't have one yet. Maybe one day I actually have a room now where I will um, where I will do my random walls myself. The only issue is that in that house there is no electricity, so I'm not sure about recording, <laughs> but at least it should work for playing. And then typically the really good solution is to have variable acoustic. Okay, so you have this type, that type, but multi-purpose recording rooms are typically characterized by having different surfaces in different places, odd walls, as much variation as you get you can get because then you have the option to displace instruments make sure that the instrumentalist finds their spot once they have their spot make sure that you can find your microphone spot such that you have a large palette of things to choose from okay and there's a lot of solutions that are kind of uh, real-time variable acoustic solutions i really love these triangles so if you have these triangles I'm not sure if I'm ever going to build them myself, but what you can have is you can have three different surfaces, and as you rotate them, you actually change the surface, the, the, the uh, kind of dominant type of surface, and you can have multiple kinds, you know, so you can have one which is diffuser, reflective, fabric, cylindrical, undulating diffuser, a whole lot of types can be produced. Okay. Room size comparisons, just you know, why do they love Abbey Road Studio 1? Well, <laughs> it's huge. The ceiling is really high. That's how it looks like. Okay. Examine that picture, put it on your wall. Okay, floors, fairly straightforward things there. General points. No single mechanism. Okay, do your thing. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit more about performance spaces and venues. I have some sexy pictures here, uh, a whole lot of things. I leave this slideshow for you to uh, enjoy at leisure. Okay, and then construction drawings, we're going to do more of that. You're going to do more of that with Max. It is confirmed. So last two weeks, we will have uh, an industry expert come and talk to you about uh, architectural side of things as well. And I think I've talked about most of these things already. A whole lot of things, just so you know, there's many. Okay, cool. Thank you for your attention. And um, I'll see you in the practice.